And welcome to another edition of the Sunday Morning Show, What is Truth? Uh, here in our studio, Dr. Michael Caesar going to be with you for the next hour, along with my partners in truth. i got uh, Brother Mark Sassy and Brother Kevin Deegan with me, and they have been uh, taking you on a tour through what is the greatest New Testament epistle. Epistle is a letter written by Paul, the apostle, to those of us who are Gentiles, which should probably be 98% of our audience here. And it's the epistle to the Romans. And it was the first great doctrinal epistle in your New Testament after the historical book of Acts. And Paul is trying to teach us that he loves, he says, I'm not ashamed of, and, and I think in his heart, he loves the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God's son. It's the power of God unto salvation. And he's been trying to show us that we all have a need for that gospel, for that good news. He showed us in the first couple chapters that the bad news is that every single one of us has stumbled and fallen somehow, some way, whether we are Jews, whether we are Gentiles, we all at one point in our life have sinned. And because of that, we end up short of the glory of God and the opportunity to be with God and the holy angels in heaven. But God, in his great love, Uh, sent his son down here to be the substitute and the payment for our sin. And in the fourth chapter, what he's been trying to show us that is that this concept of believing God and faithfully trusting in God is what God will count to a person for righteousness and allow Christ to pay for all the sins if we come by faith. So he's been using a great historical example that would be the man Abraham, Father Abraham, yes. the father of the nation. So I, I know you've been looking at this. You went through uh, the first uh, few verses of the fourth chapter uh, last time about how Abraham was justified by faith when he believed what God said. It wasn't the works. And Abraham was a good man, did some good works. He was works. a very good man, considered a friend of God. Go ahead. Yeah. And then David, the next example, was a man after God's own heart. And so you got two prime examples of Old Testament men yeah. that uh, were close with God, and yet how did they come to be right with God? And that was the question. Sure. And uh, maybe I can read through Go the ahead, first brother. eight verses. Let's review. And, yeah. yeah, just review. And so here in chapter 4 of Romans, the Bible says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? Question mark. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That's, that, that's that where we left off. verse is such a great verse. Um, Romans 4, verse 8. Uh, to have the blessing that the Lord will not impute or charge you with sin. Um, actually, I, I have that blessing now. Amen. Because I... I I became born again a number of years back when someone brought me to Bible study. And I did like Father Abraham in the sense that I believed what God was saying in his Bible. I'm trusting God at his word. And God in the word was uh, very honest with me. He said, Michael, you know, uh, you're you're a decent American, but you've uh, committed sins. And those sins are going to keep you away from me, but I have a payment for you, my son. And if you will believe in the work of my son, I will justify you, even though you're ungodly. And I said, what? I'm ungodly. And he said, yeah, by by nature, you're not godly, but I'm going to justify you. And I'm going to count your righteousness from my son. And I'm going to impute to verse six, my son's righteousness to you without you doing any work. I just want you to believe And verse 7, your iniquities will be forgiven, your sins will be covered, and I'm going to give you another blessing from this day forward. I'm not going to impute any more sin to you. 
Amen. I mean, what do you think of that, Kevin? Is that like a, a, it's a amazing good deal. or what? <laughs> it's a good deal. You ought to get in on it. That's what I think. First I, I, of all, I think of it right? like this. I think of it like, um, um, okay. Uh, in the old days, you could have a Sears credit card. I, I don't know if they still have many more. And there was a guy. They Mr. don't have Sears anymore. Okay. Well, there was a guy, <laughs> Mr. Sears, years yes. ago, right? I mean, he actually started the place. Yeah. And um, and imagine you had this Sears credit card, and you had uh, run it up way beyond your ability to pay, and you haven't paid in a long time, and you've got a massive debt of what you owed, plus all the interest on top of it. Yeah. And you could try and work it off or... Mr. Sears says, I'll tell you what, if you will trust my son, my son will pay it off for you mm. and I'll, and he'll pay off your credit card. I just want you to be a friend of my son. I want you to talk well about my son. I want you to thank my son yeah. and he'll do it all for you. And, and I said, great. And so now my credit card, uh, it's all clean and balanced. And he says, and not only that, you stay close to my son and stay friends with my son and anything you charge in the future, I'm not going to put it on your account. I'm going to put it on his. I'm not going to impute anything to you in the future. What a deal. How can I pass that up? And Amen. that's what God is saying with our sin debt regarding his son, Jesus. If we'll believe he will pay it without our works, impute it to our account and in the future that for eight, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin and that's the kind of question you can ask anyone that's going to a church you say you know i know you're going to church today why well you know i want to do good if they taught you at your church that god is willing to not impute sin to you in the future that, Amen. Yeah. and i, I never think, learned that at my church no but you know this goes back to the chapter before in romans three twenty two, where it says even the righteousness of god which is by faith of jesus christ unto all and upon all them that Believe. believe. Got to believe. Yeah. And so by that belief, by putting your faith in God's son and what he has said in the scriptures, by that, then we can have that sure, that assurance, that blessed assurance, right? Amen. That blessed hope sure. of, of eternal life. It's, and, and now after learning all these things in the first few chapters, now we're getting the illustrations from these examples of Abraham and David. And it's, it's a blessing to know for sure. Now, you were saying earlier that um, Abraham is called the friend of God. Yeah. What do you think has secured that friendship between him and God? Well, I would have to say that when God's word came to him in Genesis chapter 15, yeah. I think it's verse 6 where he says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So God kind of considered him a friend when he trusted what God said and what God wrote. Isn't that kind of the cornerstone of friendship, I, is I, trust? I, Kevin, what do you think? Does it sound reasonable? Well, or? Yeah, um, the later on in the chapter, in chapter 4, if we would read on, even he didn't stagger with what God promised him. And in spite of what he saw, his own body, aged body, his wife's womb that should have been closed up, yeah. and God gave him a promise— he, he didn't doubt it. He had faith. And Hebrews, uh, what, 11, 6 says, uh, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So, so he, he faithfully took God at his word. He said, this, this seems like a big promise you've got for me. But if you say it, I'll trust you, Lord, that you can do it. And that, is, that was a big promise given to sure. Abraham. So why wouldn't people promise or, or trust in the promise of eternal life that is similar to what you said? If, we, if I was to say, hey, the next five callers calling in, I'll pay all your bills off. Yeah. Right? God offers to sinners not to the righteous, not to the holy, not to, to sinners. Jesus Christ died for the ungodly, ungodly and he's offering to pay for all your sins, but you won't take that, but you take the, the other thing to get your, your earthly bills paid off, but you, you, you're not interested in, in the heavenly gift of eternal life and, and that the, God offers. And the great thing of this salvation, like he says in, in 4 verse 8, is not only are your past sins paid for, but you have the blessing that the Lord will not impute any future sins to you. Now, not that he's telling you to go out and sin, but he just knows 
I, I know you're going to stumble. I know you're going to make some mistakes along the way. And I don't want that hanging over your head. We're now friends. I'm going to take care of this. Uh, the blessed assurance you said, like yeah. that song that was written back in the 1800s, a uh, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I am now the heir inheritor of salvation purchased of God purchased by God and his son born of God's spirit washed in his Jesus's blood. I, I don't have to worry anymore about my sin. What that's liberating. That's Amen. something religion can't give us. That's something I experienced myself back in 2000 when I got saved. And, and I had been religious before that. I uh -huh. had gone to church for years before that. But I needed to hear from the Bible, from a preacher preaching the Word of God, yeah. that, number one, I'm a sinner, and number two, you can have that promise of eternal life. Yeah. So, so Sin's forgiven. We know. Here's what we know. Uh, we know, or let's say I know I'm a sinner, but I also know... Jesus Christ is the Savior. Yes. So the Savior is for sinners. Yes. The Savior is not for the good people and the hardworking people and the, I mean, that are trying to work off their sins. The, the Savior is for those who come empty in hand with their sins and saying, I don't know what to do with this. And he says, I will take care of it. I will justify you. Trust in me. Trust in everything I've done. And not only that, I'll cover you for the future. Amen. Great verse. Four, Romans 4, 8, a great verse. And even f Romans 4, 5, he justifieth the ungodly, which yeah. is what you were just saying. Yeah, amen. Yeah. And so then at this point, and, and we saw the example with both the, those great men, with Abraham and with David, correct, both correct. great men that both you know, had faults and sins, and, and God justified them by their belief, by their faith, uh, Kevin, you brought up uh, Psalm 32, and then we also yes. went to Psalm 51. It ties the Old Testament and the New Testament. So you've got them uh, being under faith, not works, in the Old Testament, even though we have the law back there. Yes. And that's what this whole chapter talks about. But David, Psalm 32, that's where Paul is quoting David right here yes. in Psalm 32. And then we went to Psalm 51, and then we, we saw the sacrifices of God. And that Which, it's, it's a, a broken and a contrite heart. That's what God desires of us. That we ought to be sorry for what we've done, what we've sinned against him. And he says, I've sinned against thee and thee only, David said. Yeah, yeah, David understanding the transcendence of God and the most important relationship. So David and Abraham both were good men, but probably the best part of those men is their trust in their creator, God yes. and their trust in his word and their trust in the hope of his son, the Messiah coming and taking care of everything. Uh, that's how God reckons a good man is a man who is right with him. And a good man believes a good book. Amen. It's that simple. Yeah. I mean, this is the good book written by God. Well, it's his gracious words. It says, amen. Yeah. And then here we get into verse nine on okay. Romans four. And the Bible says, I'm going to read like two verses and then sure. we'll, we'll slow down. Uh, the Bible says, cometh this blessedness. Now, what's he talking about blessedness? Just a couple of verses before, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. Yes. Whose sins are not covered. Okay, so that's, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision, period. Interesting. So, so yeah. I mean, what he's saying here, he's saying that the faith, faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Yes. And I looked up in the old dictionary, in the old 1828 dictionary, reckoned. Yes. You know, you hear that like a southern term. Well, I reckon this or I reckon that. But sure. reckoned, it means to be counted or assigned to an account. Yes. And the faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. That way he could have God's righteousness, which is what is required to get into heaven. You have to be pure. You have to be holy to get into that holy place of heaven. Yes. Yeah. Like, like an accountant, can when he's reckoning the statements on the book, see, some things are reckoned as profit, some things are reckoned as loss. Yes. And, and the profit goes into the positive ledger, you know, and then the loss goes into the red side of the ledger, which is the losses. So, so God is reckoning this, accounting all this to Abraham. Now, we always think of Abraham as the guy that 
God told to get circumcised back in Genesis 17. Yes. He, he said, now, now when you go back there, I was looking at that, and this is very interesting, and, and maybe the uh, audience will appreciate this, but in that 17th chapter, and I will just go to Genesis chapter 17, <clears throat> and Abram at the time was very old. He was 99, and the Lord says in verse 1, he appeared to Abram, and he said to him, I am the almighty God. Uh, walk before me and be thou perfect. In other words, like, like a little child, uh, just, just get close to me and walk. I'll, hold, I'll put my hand on your shoulder. You walk in front of me, and that's the perfect way I want you to live because you're walking with me, being a friend of God. And then he said in verse 2, and I will make my covenant between me and thee. And uh, verse seven, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant. And here's the covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And at the end of the verse eight, he says it again, I will be their God. So he's establishing a, a covenantal relationship of the divine creator with a mere mortal. And he's saying, and I want this relationship. I'm interested in, in us having this relationship. I'd like to establish my covenant with you, and not just with you, but you tell your children, and then I'll be their friend also, and they can be my friend, and we will have an everlasting covenant of relationship and friendship down through the ages. And, and it's a promise. A covenant is like a promise, right? Yes. Yeah. And, and he says in verse 9, and so God said to Abraham, uh, thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed, you know, thy children after thee and their generations, and my covenant that you keep with me between you and, and thy seed after thee, every man of you shall be circumcised. And, and I thought, oh, then the, that's the covenant, circumcision. But then he said in 11, no, you circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. It shall be a token of the covenant between me and you, verse 11. The covenant is back in verse 7, 8. I'm going to be your God. So, so the token is the circumcision. Yes. So I think of we talk about the covenant of marriage. And you have a beautiful wife. Yeah. And, and you two love each other. And Kevin, I know you fight with yours all the time. We're not going to bring that. I'm no, just <laughs> kidding. Just kidding. But you and Cheryl, you met. Yeah. You became friends like God and Abraham are becoming friends. There was a friendship. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good example of the same sort of thing. Developed there. Yeah. And, and you wanted to make a marriage covenant, which is a, a horizontal between a man and a woman. God saying, I'm going to make like a kind of a marriage covenant with you, Abraham, and your kids. And we did vows, which Vertical. is like a promise in front of friends and family. And yep. then when you made the vows, did you put a ring on her finger? We did. And that's the token yes. of the covenant, but it's not the covenant. So if I take the ring off, it doesn't mean I'm uh, suddenly divorced? Right. Right. Or if you were a, a, a man who didn't have a wife, but they had this special that they had this uh, cruise ship that you could get reduced rates if you went and you were married and you showed a wedding ring. So you put a wedding ring on and you go, but you're not married. You've got the token, but not the covenant. Right. So what's more important, the token or the covenant? Well, the covenant, the promise between one and the other is the important thing. And that's what he's trying to teach us in Romans. Yes. Is that the important thing is this relationship developed long before I put the token with Abraham. As a matter of fact, it was two chapters earlier, which was 25 years before that is when I met with Abraham and we became friends. That was I was just Genesis 15. Yeah. And I was just confirming it with him in the 15th. And I said, you know, now that we are friends, I, I want to have a little token, which is circumcision. And I think that's important because I think religions get hung up on tokens and things that can be seen and they miss the unseen relationship. So to kind of sum that up for a second. Yeah, go ahead. Genesis 15, Abraham believed God. Yes. And it was counted to him for righteousness. So he developed a, a covenant and a relationship with God before there was ever this circumcision that comes up later. And like you said, 25 years later, yeah. the token, right? Yeah. The sign. It would be like almost as if uh, you and Cheryl, you know, you wanted to get married and you just, honey... 
of course I want to buy you a ring. I just can't afford it right now. We can go before uh, the, the priest and the judge or the pastor. Get a marriage license. We can license. Get, get marriage. We can get the license. And when I make a little more money in a few years, I'll be happy to buy a nice, beautiful ring and put it on your finger. Right. Uh, and um, But in Abraham's case, he got saved in Genesis 15. Yes. He, he got that covenant and that relationship with God in Genesis 15 before he ever had that sign. So he was saved before the sign. That's my point. And saved that's what, before the sign. You think sign. that's what Paul's trying to teach us here? In yes. Verses? That's okay. what he tells you. Okay, go right, ahead. Right down in there. We're go ahead, Kevin. Into that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't want to jump ahead. Go right to ahead. That, help but, us. Well, well, it says that he received it when he was uncircumcised. Oh, that verse right? 11, that's what right? In verse 11. Right? Okay, good. And also uh, in verse 10, it talks about how then was it reckoned. It was not reckoned when he was circumcised. It was reckoned just like you guys said. So Paul's repeating exactly what you guys are saying here. But uh, also, you guys brought up the, uh, the reckoning and the accounting books. And accounting books always have two parties involved. You may have more than two parties, but the thing that we're in, interested in right now, if I'm the accountant, is my company and your company, or two individuals, okay. and there are columns of debts, and there's columns of payments, yes. and you're going you're gonna, to uh, reckon those or take the debts. If, if you They'll owe use the 100 term and you pay even, 50, yeah. right, you, you still owe me 50. There's 50 hanging out here. We go back up to verse 4. Yeah. There was, you know, if you work for the, re, the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So I have so to earn it and work for if it. If you work for it, it's going to go in the debt column, the debt column, the debt column. Who's going to make the payment? Who's going to pay for that debt? Because when you work... It's just you're adding more and more debt. Jesus is the one that will come along and pay in the column that will will purge those debts. Yeah. The scriptures talk about him purging our sin. Yes. There's no way for you to pay that debt because once you already owe money, you can't uh, add to that without paying. It's you add to it, you're not subtracting. Something has to pay that debt. Yeah. And the only thing that'll pay that debt is the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, I think I think the, the issue in some of the other places he talks about, I think in the third chapter he was mentioning, is the fact that the what's on the account, since God is a spirit, our sin goes on to a spiritual account. Yes. And the work that I do is in a body of flesh. And flesh and blood and all the work I do here and the sweat and the toil can't pay a spiritual debt. Uh, only Jesus Christ who came from heaven can pay a spiritual debt. And I think that's what he's trying to show us here. There's, a, cool. there's an old song that says, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you can't use something physical to wash away a spiritual sin. So, and, and the more we, we do, we're kind of digging a hole because I keep working more debt and yeah. I'm making it worse and worse and worse. Well, the scriptures talk about treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath Yeah, because that's all that's going to get paid out of that, that account. If yeah. you work, try to work your way into heaven, what's going to end up is you're building a debt that gets bigger and bigger and bigger and the scripture calls it a treasure yes it's a treasury of debt and it, it's not so, going to be a good thing so to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness Amen. and so that we've got to trust what god says and that's what abraham did he the word the of the creditor. lord came to him yeah he's the creditor okay. he gets to define the terms uh, if okay. we're doing business we have two parties yeah that's and right. i say the cost is this God gets to determine. You can't go, well, you know, I, I want to do this. I'd like to pay it I'll, I'll this way. You. Yeah, I'll rake your yard for you. I, I, I don't I'm, want my yard raked. Yeah, yeah. I want you to do this. Yes, okay. I want you to give me cold, hard cash. Yeah. That's what I like, yeah. right? God determines what will pay for, that, for those sins. And, and, and it's only the blood of Jesus Christ. Now that you mention it, okay, I, I, I don't want my yard raked. I want it to be paid, and I want it to be paid in blood. So if you want to pay with your blood... Which isn't going to cover it. It's not you eternal. can die. It's not pure. Yeah. But if you'll let my son pay it with his blood, he'll give you a gift of eternal life. He's the only so, one that can recognize So you have this big, long column yeah. now, right? Of debt, of debt, of debt. Big, yeah. long column. Well, when Jesus showed up to John the Baptist, what did John the Baptist say? Behold, 
the Lamb, Lamb of, God, of God, just like the Old Testament, the sacrifice that was sacrificed in the Old Testament, that was just pointing to Jesus Christ coming yep. and being the the real sacrifice. It was just a shadow of the real sacrifice. Amen. But behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh, taketh away, away the, the sin, sin of, the of the whole world. world. So yes. your big long column can be taken away, can, just what? like you were talking about. You could pay off somebody's bills. Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. He and, died for sinners. And Amen. the blood of Christ cleanseth eternally from all sin, which is why you can get that blessing that the Lord won't impute any future sin to you because it's already paid off. He, he take care of it. He took yeah. that whole column out. There you go. There you go. And I think Hebrews, the book of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. Yeah. So... So here we are, and he's, he's talking, Paul the Apostle in Romans is talking about the circumcision or not circumcision, and we see that Abraham was, he was saved before the sign of circumcision, yeah. right? And uh, if I read on verse, I think we were at 11, and yeah. he, that would be Abraham, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed also un, unto them also. So, so he was a, a type being set forth and God saying, the friendship I have with Abraham, I'm willing to have with you. And, and Paul's writing to both the Jews and the Gentiles in, in Rome, right? Because yes. he's writing to the people at Rome and he's calling them both Jews and Gentiles. Yes. And he's saying, I know some of you uh, Jews, you're, you're circumcised. I know you Gentiles, you're uncircumcised. But the key is the relationship. And, and Abraham developed the relationship. No matter what you look like, you know, below the waist, have you developed the relationship? You've got to follow in the steps of Abraham and get that relationship going. You know, we're just about out of time in the first half of the show. And we're with you again every Sunday morning from uh, 7 to 8 o'clock. And we enjoy being with you. Go to the Big WEC uh, site and you can listen to the archive shows here. You can go to our website, graceandtruthchurch.org. And you can uh, watch some of the shows. They film them, put up on uh, YouTube, and you can uh, do that. But we always uh, invite you, if, if you're home, to open the Bible. Amen. And we're looking right now on what is probably the most important uh, book in the New Testament, the one that explains to us how we can be justified given the righteousness of Jesus Christ, have it imputed without us doing works, just coming by faith, and have the blessing that the Lord will not impute any future sin to us, uh, that to have the confidence that no matter what happens to us in the future, we are now in friendship with God, like Father Abraham, and just as Abraham goes to paradise, Abraham's bosom, uh, we too will go to the same place on faith, and now Paul talks a lot about circumcision here, but in four or 500 years after this is written, another problem crept up in the church that people seem to have to do all the time. And there's a token of baptism. And I think Paul's going to address this uh, concept too. And yes. so stick around for the second half of the show. We'll be right back with you on what is truth. And welcome back to the What is Truth radio program. We've been working our way through Romans uh, chapter four uh, because it, it is a great thing when you learn about the true gospel of Jesus Christ, which is not based on religious traditions or works or circumcision or baptism or any type of sacrament. It's based on just believing what God said about his son and believing what his son actually did for you for me, for the whole world on that cross, when, when he went up there as a substitute and uh, he bore in his body all of our sins so that he could say it is finished and he would like to give to us the gift of righteousness without works but righteousness by faith, us being justified and having this blessing. Now, it, it, Paul took the time to explain to these people in you know the first century that the big issue that the Jews were so hung up on is circumcision. You've got to get the baby circumcised. The baby's got to be circumcised. If we don't have the circumcision, the baby can't be part of the covenant. But Paul's trying to explain the covenant was before circumcision. Yes. The covenant is spiritual. Circumcision 
is a religious ceremony that's physical. God's not looking for physical religious ceremonies. He's looking for a spiritual relationship. And I think after he wrote this, I mean, even the devil himself was saying, you know, I've been trying to trick these people and to get more hung up on the token and the wedding ring and the circumcision than the relationship. Now, I can't use circumcision anymore because it's been covered here. And I believe another book covers it. Galatians, right? Yes. Um, Go ahead, brother. What are you thinking? I was just thinking about the, the ring. It's just, this is just a picture of the already established relationship. Even before we get married. Yes. We're already, you know, we, we become espoused, right? We're developing that relationship. We're developing a relationship. The relationship is growing. Yes. This, this is just a picture, just like a wedding ring. Circumcision is a picture of the already existing relationship between Abraham and God. It was given after because, and baptism, which you want to talk about is just a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection, which I've already entered into. Only believers should be baptized. Not sure. You don't become baptized to become a Christian. You don't become baptized. Uh, I don't put a ring on to be married. That's not what makes me married. What really makes me married is the relationship, and, right? And the Before ring is a, the ring is an outward a, physical a, thing, exactly. right? Yes. So, yes. But but God desires an inward. He wants the inward that, yeah. that's, stuff. That's that's a good point you're bringing there. I'm just thinking about it. So, because you'll you'll hear about um, movies or novels or even songs about one person at a workplace, a guy, and he sees this girl. And he, oh, I really love that girl. I want that girl. I wish she'd recognize me. I wish she'd know me. I wish I, I could have a relationship with her. And 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 so he says, you know what I think I'll do? Her name is Mary. He goes to his favorite jeweler. He has a beautiful ring with Mary uh, engraved on there and puts it on his finger and says, here we are. We've got this. And she looks at him like, we don't have any relationship. That's, that's phony. Just because you've got a token. Right. And that's what circumcision or baptism can be. I've gone about and I've done this, but I have no, no relationship. No relationship there. Yeah. Nothing on the inside. There you go. That's not going to yeah. work. Yeah. So like in verse 11, where you were going is, uh, and he received the sign of circumcision. Again, it says that it was reckoned, the justification, the righteousness of Abraham was reckoned by God, by God, not by Abraham doing anything. Right. Abraham did not perform any ordinances. He didn't perform any rituals. He didn't perform any works. It was reckoned the accountant is God. It's not Abraham. Abraham wasn't building up all these debts and I'm going to work these debts off. No, God reckoned it. It was, and, and, he, and he based it now. It says God looks on the heart. Yes. So God could, uh, he said one day he'll judge the secrets of men. God will do that because he can look on the heart. Yes. And he's looking at Abraham's heart and what he's seeing is he really trusts me. He's right. really believing. Yeah. You know, going back to the marriage thing, right? Yeah. It's like I, I tell like folks all the time, it's like, look, God, God is not, you're, think of your wife. She is not interested in all that other stuff. What she's interested in is a relationship. She doesn't want to know. Uh, what she wants to know is that you know her, that you spend time with her, that you appreciate her, that you know her favorite color, you know her favorite foods, that you know you care, she, and that and you listen to her, that you, you listen hear her. to her, and a relationship. My relationship with my wife was long distance at first. I didn't even live here. And we wrote letters back and forth. You know what they're called? Love letters. That's by I'm God's holding a love letter right God, here from Bible. God yeah. Yeah. to you. You need to get this relationship going. Yeah. There are people that, you know, if I told you my wife is six foot five and has red hair, that's not true. It's like... <laughs> I, I explained this to a Mormon man one time because he said, well, how come God seems different in the Old Testament to the New? How come he, he said, uh, you know, there seems to be changes? I said, well, I just met you. What do you know about my family? What do you know about what I do for a living? You know, as we develop our relationship, you'll know how many kids I have. You'll know what I like, what I dislike. God wants to have a relationship with you. And he wrote a love letter to you that you can open this thing up and God's talking to you. Right when you read word. this, he's talking to you. But Paul right here says that um, it was reckoned when he was in 
uh, was in circumcision or uncircumcision, verse 10, not in circumcision, but uncircumcision. So God rectified the books before he even had this sign. Okay. And then verse 11, I, I love this verse because it said, he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith, not the works, not the rituals that he performed, not the ordinance he performed, nothing that Abraham did. It was, it was his beliefs, his faith, his trust in God. That's how he got the seal of righteousness uh, from his faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. He received, he was uncircumcised. He was reckoned righteous before he was circumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, not do, not work, not join a church, not be a good person. Or get baptized. That, get baptized, though they be not circumcised that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So, and so here's a guy that didn't do anything. Yeah. He's not he's not doing anything but trusting God. And then they others this can pass on to you too. I and mean that's like that's really cool. Paul's trying to say here because he's writing to an audience in Rome and I'll bet over 90% of them have never been circumcised. They're Gentiles. Right. And he's saying you can have the same friendship with God that Abraham, the, the so-called father of the Jewish nation, had. Because it wasn't the fact that he was a Jew that made him the friend of God. It was the fact that he trusted what God said. And he, in his heart, he turned to the Lord. And that's what God wants, a relationship with your heart turning to him, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and God. And when Abraham trusted God yeah. and believed God... Uh, if we go back for a second to verse 9, it says, Cometh this blessedness. Abraham was blessed by God, yep. right? That covenant, that promise. Well, you could, you could look at the same verse and say, Cometh this blessedness uh, upon the church members only, you know, instead of using the word circumcision, or cometh this blessedness upon the baptized only, or upon the tithers only, mm -hmm. or I could go on and on. Any kind of thing that you might be able to do, sure. does this blessedness come that way? No, it says, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So it's not in anything that we can do. And it's, you know, you got to stop saying that you're a Christian because somebody baptized you as a baby or that you were born into a church family or some kind of a thing like that. That's not how you become a Christian and have a relationship with God. It's the way that we've been saying over the last few minutes is trusting God, believing what God said, his words. So Abraham was saved before the sign, without the sign. The sign doesn't save you. Uh, the Bible says Jesus saves. And that's really what it's about. Um, in fact, I just want to make a, a quick mention. In John chapter 8, when Jesus himself is having a confrontation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, these are circumcised Jews that he's yeah. speaking to face to face. And he's having a confrontation with them and telling them that they are not of their father, Abraham, but they are of their father, the devil, he says in verse 44. Yeah, yeah. But they're circumcised. Yeah. So they've got the outward sign like a wedding ring, but inwardly, they got problems. Sure, they have the wrong spirit. The, 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 the devil has the wrong spirit toward God. Even though the devil believes in God, and James writes about this, the devils believe in God. Religious people believe in God. <laughs> but they're not the friend of God because they don't believe what God has written in his word. The devil, when he came on the scene, the first thing he did was doubt God's word. The devil doubts the word of God. He disobeys the word of God. He distracts people from the word of God. Changes the word of God. Changes the word. And God's desire is that we would trust him at his word. Amen. Read the book. There you go. You need to read the book. Amen. So you, you guys talked about being, uh, Abraham was blessed. Galatians 3, 9 talks about that blessedness. Now, and I, I the just want the blessedness wanna, of Romans 4 too, right? I want to tell the, the audience now, you know, Paul did write this great book of Romans. And the Bible does say that, you know, the scripture is given for doctrine. And it is. But then it also says the scripture is given for correction. And some of the people writing or reading the book of Romans got confused about works. And Paul wrote a little book to correct them, like a companion epistle to Romans. And that's Galatians. That's that small little book. And, and he was 
frustrated. He said, I marvel that you people here in Galatia are so soon removed from the grace of Christ, the good news about Christ, the gospel of Christ to another gospel. And he says, there really is no other gospel. It's a perverted gospel. And, and no matter who tells it to you, a perverted gospel will leave you accursed. We're not blessed by God and with the, the door of heaven open to you, but accursed of God and separated from God. And so he's telling us, and the, the issue they had in Galatians was circumcision, wasn't it? The and, Judaizers yeah. came there and said, oh, you got to believe in Jesus, but also and get they were, circumcised. They were also trusting in their, the covenant made in the Old Testament. Okay. Hey, we're Jews. Right, we be and, of and Abraham. We be of Abraham, and we, you know, and the circumcision is the sign, and they put that more important than the relationship again. But uh, verse nine says, "So then they that be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham," and so we can enter into the same blessings. And then, you know, I was thinking of this. You, you read the hymn, "Blessed Assurance." Yeah. And uh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And it made me think of um, that covenant marriage relationship. I've heard it said that the longer you go, you know, when you first fall in love, you're like, oh, man, I'm like crazy about that woman, right? It's like all you can think about. But I've heard people say, can you imagine being like, like 80 years married to someone? 80 years, they say the love grows. The love grows. That's the foretaste. We're yeah. just getting you, you we're just getting a taste here. Wait till we get to heaven. We're getting the down payment. This life is nothing compared to what God has planned for Christians. Also. That's the earnest. But that blessedness, we, we're blessed here and we got a blessed blessed hope. And that blessed hope is guess who? Jesus Christ. He's going to get Amen. us there. And, and, in, and in Galatians, like you were saying, Paul, Paul got frustrated with them. He said, you foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? <laughs> I mean, I, I want to ask you a question. Did you receive the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, by the works you were doing, you know, of the law, Galatians 3, 2? Or did you receive it by the hearing of faith? I mean, you were begun in the Spirit by the hearing of faith. Now you think you've got to do all these uh, physical works afterwards. God is trying to build you up in your spirit. It is a most holy spiritual faith where God is working on the inside of believers. Our soul and our spirit is what needs to be changed. Amen. You know, not, not our body so much, not a circumcision or a baptism or wearing of rings or earrings or things like that. It's not outward things. God is trying to work on the inside with us. That's the beauty of the gospel. Well, Galatians repeats about the blessing of Abraham in, yeah. in chapter three, verse 14. How do you get it? Well, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, that'd be us, through mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. Amen. So he, he's confirming again and again. But how, how do you earn a promise? <laughs> you have it's to a receive promise. it. It's a promise. You yeah. just trust it's the guy promise. making the promise yeah. is good for it. I it's, believe it's that guy. It's a promise. Yeah. yeah. You, you yeah. can't earn a promise. You can't work your way to a promise. Yeah. God is offering this thing. Yeah. It's a free gift. It's a promise. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you just take it? Why don't you just receive it? Well, what happens these days? I mean, here we are in 2022. Abraham lived back in, I don't know. 2000 BC or something around then. Around yeah. then. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. you know, we're it's talking 4,000. It's the human condition. That's where you're going, right? Like yeah. once you mess up, once somebody messes up, what do they want to do? They want to fix it, right? So it must be, I know I, if, if you know that you sinned, you want to fix it. So what, I'm going to fix it. I'm what gonna what did Adam and life. Eve do? Adam and Eve, I, I when they up. sinned, yep. they grabbed some they fig covered leaves. Up, covered they recognized up they were naked. Yep. And that's what humans do. So they were... I want to get baptized. I'm going to join a church. I'm going to be a good person. Well, you know, you were talking about uh, if a promise is made, the thing is, you know, you, you're supposed to trust the promise. And the reason we know not to and we don't is our experience is people have made promises and haven't kept them. I mean, publishers, clearinghouse oh, is constantly yeah. uh -huh. sending me stuff that yeah. I'm going to get a million dollars. I've never <laughs> yeah. gotten it. I mean, they're, they're not worthy of the promise. But yes. the difference here is yes. we're talking about the creator. We're yes, talking yes. about the omnipotent uh, God, the, the omniscient God, the eternal God making a promise. 
and his promises are yea and amen, and he, he never and, lets anyone down on him. And he, and says, he cannot lie. He yeah. says God in Psalm eighty nine thirty four, yeah. my covenant will I not break, yes. nor alter the thing that cometh forth from my lips. So Come he's on. not going to break his promise, and he's not going to change it. Amen. So, so what are you going to trust in? You're going to trust in reforming your life? You already, you already messed up. You know you messed up. And you're going to try to cover it up. You're going to try to make it better. Or are you going to just trust in God? Well, one of the things we did can't trust. Lie, that it, 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 did promise. It, it not, I wasn't trusting in myself. I'm going to be honest with you. But I did trust in the organized uh, international religion I was part of. Yeah. I, I, as a little boy, I was taught to trust that. Those people, they, they know the Lord. Um, those people, and you can trust what they say, and you can trust what the church says. But God is trying to, even with Abraham, it's not so matter you're trusting the priest at the temple, you're trusting me. You're trusting what I've written down. Uh, God wants to put us aside and get a direct one-on-one -on -one relationship. Yes. Well, that's probably who Paul was talking to here, old foolish Galatians. Okay. Right? They were trusting they were these guys, people. Yeah. But they were also guys that were either involved, they could even been priests or whatever in the nation of Israel. Um well, but, or trusting those priests because that's our religion, right? And, and now, it, now one verse that that's interesting: Galatians two twenty one. That's a good one. Galatians two twenty one. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Incidentally, in the book of Mark, Mark chapter seven, it has the word uh, of frustrate, and the marginal reference is to reject, but frustrate or, or reject the grace. Of God, and like we were saying before, the promise God wants to make to us is not by works, right. but of grace. But if I trust anything else, I frustrate and reject God's grace from working in my life. That's the problem I was having: trusting religious people running around in robes, trusting stained glass window churches, uh, trusting certain prayers made on beads, or, or putting money into a little box next to a candle that I lit next to a statue. I was trusting in those things, and I was frustrating the grace of God. Well, this is the very verse that I Go went ahead. to just about two weeks ago when I bumped into a pastor that I did not know at all. Okay. But he was trying to convince me that we're saved by works. It must be by works. And I said right here, Romans 2, uh, I'm sorry, Galatians 2.21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And I said, look, you know, all these things that you're trusting in that are not Christ, whether it be baptism or confirmation or some kind of sacrament, there might be seven of them, yeah. any of those things, the Bible says that I shall not frustrate the grace of God those, those ways. Sure. And, and, you know, today I, I grabbed, this is a, a worship book. And it's from a local church right here in Western New York. Okay. It's something that I purchased when they were getting new ones. Okay. And in here it talks about baptism. And this is not just talking about it, but it's actually the... the but those are all the, kinds of things. You're the doctrines, you're the teachings of that particular church. Well, this, this is but what, the, what this, you're supposed to do. This is what right? you're if supposed you're to do. you're a member of the church, yeah. here's a whole book of things you have to do. Yes. So it's, the, just, it's like the liturgy. Works. Those just, are works. Why okay. not just go to this book? Direct from God. I why agree. Why would I take it secondhand from somebody else? All these works when we know it's not even works anyway. So the book you're holding, Kevin, is it's the, the book written by God. Yep. Yes. The book you're God. holding, Mark, is a I'm book holding written a by the best men, the best religious men that right. could put it together. And okay. so, so whether it's priests or pastors or whatever you want to call them, it's I mean, they, they go and they open this up when there is a a, a, a day when they're doing a baptism. Okay. okay. And so here in the book it says. Uh, our Lord commanded baptism, saying to his disciples in the last chapter of Matthew, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, on and on. And then he says, The holy apostles of the Lord have written that baptism now saves you. Now, he's quoting 1 Peter 3, 19, I believe. And it's taking it completely out of context. But I'll get back to that in a second. Here's some of the other things that are unbiblical that just like nails on a chalkboard just goes completely against what God's word in the Bible says. Yes. This, this, uh, this thing here that the priests and the pastors use, it says, receive the sign of the Holy Cross upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed. Well, that's not what the Bible says. 
And, and that's what, what we were doing. Dis- they, 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 they tick the water and they make a little cross on your forehead, the baby's forehead? Yes, and then they say that that marks you as one redeemed by Christ, the crucified. That's an outward, physical, fleshy type of work. Yeah, and that goes against the example of Abraham. Right, right. Yeah. And then it also says that, uh, you know, because a lot of times it's an infant that's being baptized. It says, uh, for a sponsor, it's your task as a sponsor to confess with the whole church the faith in God, in whose name this child is to be baptized. How can a sponsor take a place? Is, can somebody do that in a marriage? So in hey, other my, words, my, the baby is supposed to take the faith of the sponsor rather than have his own faith. Correct. But, but it, it said it has to come by faith, and the baby doesn't even know what he's believing. And, and Galatians, in Galatians, it says that we are all... Children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. How can a baby have faith in Christ Jesus? Well, Paul, in the next book after Romans, said, um, Christ sent me not to baptize. Yes. That's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Yeah, but to preach the gospel, uh, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be of none effect. But the preaching of the cross is the power of God. He says in verse 18, um, God, by his wisdom, has chosen that it please God by, he calls it the foolishness of preaching, to save them that believe. Because, I mean, you mean all I got to do is just hear something and not do anything? It's That seems foolish. I mean, that's all I got to do. And God says, yeah, because I'm asking for you to trust me. Yes. It, it, you think it's foolish because you're used to working, but I'm trying to establish a spiritual relationship with you. And Paul, who's the great ap- ap- apostle, to Gentiles, that'd be most of our audience here. Yeah, he says, "Christ sent me not to baptize." Well, so it, it can't it, be the same. Can't be the gospel because he sent me not to baptize, but to, but preach. to preach the gospel. Yes, it cannot be the gospel. And what you were saying was making me think of you know, as men. Well, let's have some religious theater. Let's have the smoke. Let's have the nice windows. Let's have all this stuff. Get up nice robes on and all that. Men would rather do that. God's not interested in that. He's interested in your heart. He doesn't so, want the so, fig leaves. So, he what, doesn't want the so, fig leaves. So when Jesus came the first time, there was big organized religion that would fight, fight with him constantly. They were the he, main ones that had conflict with yeah. the Lord himself. Yeah, He would go to Jerusalem, they'd fight with him. Yeah. He'd go up to Capernaum, the synagogue leaders would fight with him up there. Everyone, he, uh, the, these religious guys in robes were fighting with him all the time. And he was trying to say, and, and he did say it in, in Matthew at one point, you know, you're making the word of God of none effect by all your traditions yes. that you've added. And they added religious traditions. There's something about people love to add religious traditions. Today, you go through the phone book under C for churches. It'll start with, I don't know, A, Assemblies of God. And then B, there'll be Baptist churches. And then there'll be Methodist churches. There'll be L under Lutheran churches. E, Episcopal churches all through there. And, And from what I've understood, just about every one of those churches has a most of them has a procedure where little babies are baptized a majority of those churches you just named would follow this type that of book thing. right there yes, about baptism yes. being necessary that, for a little baptism baby. brings you into the family of god which it, it talks about this further on but yet if i remember in the bible john chapter 4 verse 2 jesus himself baptized not Right. And, and yet the, the key verse in Luke's gospel is that Jesus came to seek and to save them that are lost. Yes. So if Jesus came to seek and to save them that are lost, how come Jesus didn't go around baptizing? And every example that we see in the New Testament of a baptism, it's with an adult. Every. You never, ever, ever see a child being baptized. What about Acts chapter 8? Isn't there a great example in the 8th chapter of Acts? It is in the King James Bible. Oh, okay. But somehow it's Let's changed in the other ones. <laughs> Let's take a look. We got two minutes. Run through that quickly for so, us, brother. So in Acts chapter 8, there's a story about Philip. And Philip meets up with... Uh, well, Ethiopian eunuch? The Ethiopian eunuch. So in Acts chapter 8, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, he's reading, he's riding on his chariot, and he's reading Isaiah the prophet in yep. Acts 8.28. And then the Spirit says unto Philip, uh, join near unto the chariot. And uh, Philip ran up to him, he says, understandest thou what thou readest? 
he says, how can I except some man should guide me? And he gets to this place in the scripture about Jesus, and Philip preached unto him Jesus. Actually, he was reading in the Old Testament. Yes. He was reading from the book of Isaiah about a, a person that was, it said this person, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. He was like a lamb dumb before his shears. Uh, this person in Isaiah that they're prophesying, open not his mouth. Uh, this person's judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation? His life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch reads us and says to Philip, who's this talking about? Yeah, now, how's it, it go on, Mark? And then so Philip opened his mouth and he began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And, that this is a prophecy of Jesus. Yeah. Okay. And so he's starting to understand and as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch, who's this new believer, yep. he says, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And this is where something changes in verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And in he in other words, if, if you trust in your heart, and there's actually been like a spiritual relationship developed between you and God and Jesus, then you, then you can have the token and have the baptism. And so it's critical to know in verse 37, the answer. He asks a question in verse 36, see here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? You must receive the answer to that question. Yeah. So the answer is you have to believe. And here in my left hand, I'm holding an NIV, a modern Bible that a lot of churches use today yeah. Yeah. In, in Western New York. Yeah. And if I go to Acts chapter 36, it says, and they, tra they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Verse 37 is gone. It's missing. It's gone. It's completely gone. And, and verse it goes 38. right to verse 38. The yeah, number the is numbers, gone. The number is gone. Yeah. Amazing. And it's that way in many modern yeah, Bibles amazing. because they don't want you to understand the trickery that's going on. Uh, well, we're running out of time, but the good thing we learned is that you can be a friend of God by faith. And you can have the blessing that Paul spoke of right there where you will be justified without works and the Lord will never impute sin to you. And that's the good news and that is truth. And we'll see you again next week at uh, Sunday at 7 a.m. Until then, open the book of Romans, read it, and you'll know what is truth.